Hello, welcome to this introduction to basic moral orientations. This will simply be an overview of what to expect throughout the course of this ethics class. Welcome, I'm Doug Borkman and I'm based this uh, presentation on an original PowerPoint by Professor Lawrence Hinman of San Diego State University. When we talk about making moral decisions, on what basis do we make them? Well, what comes to mind are the following items. People typically say that they make moral decisions based upon what the Bible tells them to do, otherwise known as divine command theory. There's also what we call the ethics of conscience. Following your conscience is perhaps sometimes a guide for many people in our culture. Certainly you've heard of this one, watch out for number one, otherwise known in fancier terminology as ethical egoism. Doing the right thing is called the ethics of duty. Don't diss me, the ethics of respect. The notion that people are created with certain inalienable rights, the ethics of rights or natural rights, such as, for example, all persons are created equal. The idea about making a world a better place is principally a utilitarian concept. The ethics of fairness and justice, such as, for example, Daddy, that's not fair, and the ethics of simply being a good person, known as virtue or aretaic ethics. Let's discuss each of these in brief detail. Let's start with do what the Bible tells you, otherwise known as divine command theories. On this view, being good is equivalent to doing whatever the Bible or the Koran or some other sacred text or scriptural document or source, such as Revelation, tells you to do. What this has to do with is what is right equals what God tells a person to do. Without becoming too heavily critical, it's very clear, and I'm sure that you've had this experience yourself before, that different scriptures, uh, different sacred texts, different religions who depend upon these texts, often say something a little bit different about what the will of God is. So the problem becomes how to resolve it, and often it's irresoluble, and this sometimes ends in war, strife, hardship, and uh, what appears to be a situation of such great controversy that is extremely difficult to have a dialogue about. The ethics of following your conscience, otherwise known as your inner voice. It could well be that conscience tells us what is right or wrong. Of course, if you uh, bought into um, a somewhat now, I suppose, dated view, but such as the Freudian view of uh, where conscience comes from, it's probably one of those things that uh, you would have to say, if that uh, view is true, the Freudian view, that conscience could be different in different folks. Uh, maybe it is uh, otherwise known as superego, and it is a function of how your parents brought you up, how you were raised, and perhaps it's that hidden little voice that sometimes gets silent, uh, or silenced, but uh, it would seem to be heavily dependent upon familial upbringing, but it's clear that there's a religious source often associated with uh, the inner voice, where that voice is the voice of God. It could be, whether you're religious or not, um, that there is something that we're just simply born with, uh, almost biologically hardwired into our system, and that it therefore is a function of what it means to be a human being. But whatever the source, it's uh, very clear that Conscience can be negative, uh, and in fact, uh, Socrates seems to have uh, been reported several times as suggesting that uh, he had a little demonic-like being sitting on his shoulder, telling him what not to do, or cautioning him when he was on the verge of perhaps committing some sort of sin or some immoral act. Of course, for Socrates, it was probably never as serious as it might be for a latter-day politician, the kind of nasty thing that he might have done. But nevertheless, he claimed that he had something like a conscience, something like a little voice that was talking in his left ear, telling him what not to do. That's what we mean by often it's negative in character. It doesn't necessarily tell you, tell you what to do, but can tell you what, it, um, what not to do. Uh, again, problematically speaking, without getting into too much detail, uh, conscience could be different for different folks, depending upon how they're raised. So if you try to... Um, you know, substantiate your moral theory on conscience per se, merely conscience, you probably find yourself uh, in a situation of relativism, moral relativism, because every person's conscience, or uh, depending upon their society, again, 
um, and the manner in which they were brought up would be different. Watching out for number one. Now, some people, I suppose, argue that uh, you don't really need an ethical principle out of this, that, in fact, it's just normal for people to do that. However, there is a difference that will be discussed later on in ethics courses uh, between what is called ethical egoism, as you see here, and what we call psychological egoism. Psychological egoism is the view that you can't help yourself but think of number one, numero uno. However, ethical egoism says something different, that even if you were born, let us say, what is called an altruist, that um, it is more appropriate to behave as an egoist um, and basically proclaims the idea that the only person to look out for is yourself. And of course you get much of this through someone such as Anne Rand uh, in her book The Ethics of Selfishness and also another book called Atlas Shrugged. In any case, while she is a, a very great spokesperson, now deceased of course, uh, for this particular view, probably popularized it uh, about 40, 50 years ago. Uh, there are many people who are ethical egoists uh, that abound and consciously tell themselves that the appropriate form of uh, ethical and moral comportment is to principally put your own interests before the other. Again, that's a theory. And to be contrasted with the uh, notion of psychological egoism, which is uh, a different kind of a theory about um, how it is that we can't help but be egoists. Highly controversial issue. Ethical egoism is actually a prescriptive theory that is telling you and me how we ought to behave. The ethics of doing the right thing, that is to say doing your duty. And of course this starts with the conviction that ethics is about doing what's right, about doing what duty uh, calls you to do. Um, I personally will get into more detail on this as the course proceeds, but uh, it is in fact what we call a deontological approach. We'll study deontology, utilitarianism, utilitarianism, and other theories in far more detail. But uh, for now, suffice it to say that the ethics of doing your duty has to do with picking out a principle that can be universalized and uh, it can be thus looked upon as a moral imperative. It's a want to do your duty because that is what is universally required and required by reason. So Kant, who is the principal spokesperson for the ethics of duty, otherwise known as deontology, basically said, do what any rational agent would or should do morally after, after arriving at uh, a decision what to do based upon logical uh, determinations. And of course, you can consider that a duty seems to be associated with a profession. There is a physician's duty to care for the sick, just like you probably have a duty in your professional role to do certain things that don't necessarily uh, jive well with your own conscience, let's say. And then, of course, there's a social role, such as what is, what is a parent's duty to care for his or her children. So there are all sorts of, as we say, deontological kinds of things uh, with respect to duty that kick in uh, when you talk about doing the right thing. But it's basically based upon principle and the use of reason or logic. The ethics of respect is a very interesting one, and uh, it has been around for some time, but I think that we have seen a little bit more of it in the 20th century, surely. Um, the idea is, of course, here that uh, all of our human act actions should be governed by certain rules of respect. And again, what's problematic potentially is uh, what counts as respect in one culture may be different than what counts as respect in another culture. Some places it's inappropriate to spit on the sand. Uh, in other places throughout the world, showing the soles of your shoes while in conversation with somebody, someone. Um, according to the philosopher Richardson and other places where it's been documented is uh, something that you wouldn't want to do. And of course you have to ask the question, what is it that really merits respect in a human being? Uh, the idea of course about respect is uh, two, uh, to be translated uh, from that uh, notion that we have with regard to basic human dignity. Respecting a human being just qua human as such for being what he or she is is part of the ethics of respect and it, it would at that level seem to transcend uh, simply culture or cultural relativism. The idea uh, that we have rights, the idea that all persons are created with certain inalienable rights, certainly a constitutional notion, and uh, probably it can be regarded as one of the most influential moral notions of the past two centuries. Uh, by adhering to this idea that we all have basic human rights, we tend to establish minimal conditions of human decency. The only question that arises, it would seem, um, main one in any case, is where do these rights come from? 
A natural rights theorist would say that rights come from the universe, possibly that they are bestowed upon us by God. You don't necessarily have to believe in God uh, to believe in uh, the notion of rights or natural rights. Uh, but one way to look at it is to argue against it and see what the world would be like if you decided that perhaps we don't have such things as basic human rights. Part of the question, of course, there is what is a basic human right? Uh, the Universal Declaration of uh, uh, Human Rights uh, that was uh, pretty much developed and published about 1948 um, seems to have capitalized on this notion of rights and suggested that basic human rights include such things as uh, entitlement to medical treatment, entitlement to uh, minimal amounts at least of shelter, clothing, food, and uh, one would think that there's a degree to which the notion of rights is behind much of the current controversy about things such as, for example, nationalized health care. The idea of making the world a better place. This is not to say that there aren't certain religions and other philosophies even that uh, would like to see the world become a better place, but utilitarianism tends to focus on that uh, as uh, certainly um, promoted and promulgated by Mr. John Stuart Mill, whom you see here pictured. Uh, what utilitarianism does is to uh, try to reduce suffering and increase pleasure or happiness, depends on what version of utilitarianism, which we'll go into more detail on uh, later on in the course. Um, demands a high degree of self-sacrifice because we have to consider the consequences for everyone the best we can. Uh, the idea behind utilitarianism is to maximize, ma maximize the greatest amount of good for the greatest number, however that notion of good is translated or parsed. And uh, you can kind of see that it would be almost inordinately difficult a task if every single thing you set out to do with respect to a moral action or some form of ethical behavior required that you set and calculate the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. It can be modified. You can perhaps circumscribe the people, for example, and other entities such as wildlife and, and uh, other creatures like your pet. You can cir circumscribe the community of people that are really directly involved with respect to decisions you make, such as your family or your neighborhood or perhaps even your country. But I think it becomes extremely difficult to act on uh, a pure principle of utilitarianism if you uh, literally uh, take it that uh, you need to maximize the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. But the idea, of course, here is to make the world a better place. And uh, if you are attempting to do that, then uh, every act that you undertake will be with regard for a consequence or consequences, intended consequences, that are uh, designed to realize a greater state of happiness and goodness for all concerned. We're trying to capture the notion of justice and the idea of actually fairness, but they're two slightly distinct things. Some people, like um, the uh, noted uh, now deceased philosopher, uh, 20th century philosopher, Rawls, uh, tended to equate justice and fairness, although that probably is a simplistic way of putting it. But the idea is that uh, early in uh, one's life, particularly if you have siblings, you can get an idea that sort of gets ingrained into you about fairness. Um, how, does, uh, how do the parents treat Johnny versus Janine? Um, how does your teacher uh, treat one student over another? Seems like all teachers uh, have a, a student pet or two. Do they get favorable treatment and is that fair? Figuring out what is fair and then trying to administer a justice system based upon it is a daunting task indeed. And it might be said that treating people equally may not necessarily mean treating them the same. Uh, in other words, if you identify that some people actually are in greater need than others, it may be a fairer solution to provide uh, more amenities, so to speak, for those who are in more desperate need. It would still be fair or just, would it not? Highly controversial, but uh, hopefully you'll be thinking about this and other of these traditions as we progress. Being a good person, otherwise known as virtue ethics, is pretty much exclusively a Greek phenomenon, and the Greek word for virtue ethics, or virtue, is arataic, so that's sometimes uh, we refer to virtue ethics as arataic ethics. Uh, in this view, virtue is the word for excellence, and so the idea is, uh, certainly for Plato and Aristotle, uh, Aristotle more poignantly, the idea is that a human being should uh, develop maximally his or her properly human capacities. 
So um, we want to develop our capacities intellectually and physically, emotionally even, and concentrate on character traits which are advantageous to what it means to be a fully flowering human being. It's a very organic view. In much the way in which a flower needs water and discipline to some extent, maybe some uh, plants need discipline in the form of pruning and fertilizing and things like this, uh, a growing individual, a young person, uh, needs to have a certain amount of mentoring and coaching and counseling and pretty common sense and intuitive. Um, the thing to remember, however, here is that virtue ethics, is in contrast with the previous uh, traditions that we briefly touched upon here in this orientation, uh, does not concentrate on rules, per se. It concentrates on the kind of person that uh, you should become. And, of course, if you have a good person, the idea naturally seems to follow that you're going to make better decisions. Uh, the Greek uh, philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, pretty much were responsible for developing this thought. But I think that... Um, you can probably notice if you've had any uh, experience studying maybe like Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism even to some extent, that there's some similar ideas there, particularly with respect to Buddhists, the Buddhist uh, uh, Four Noble Truths. Um, one of the Noble Truths is the Eightfold Path, and the Eightfold Path, I think, in, in some respects looks a lot like the Golden Mean and uh, the Golden Moderation uh, that uh, Aristotle advances a kind of a geometric mean between two extremes that a person should strike for, and it's that which is excellence. And of course, we, we can't get into it in great detail here. This is just simply a kind of an overview of the uh, theories and orientations and the concepts that we're going to be working with this semester. But um, indeed, I think you'll find that uh, somewhere between and amongst these uh, various orientations, you will be able to sort of label and, and, uh, and peg yourself. You might be... Uh, might have a couple of these sort of working behind the scenes, uh, maybe in some cases uh, unconsciously, when you make moral decisions or when you evaluate the moral decisions of others. But uh, in truth, the notion about being a good person, be the best that you can be, is a part of the Western phenomenon. And uh, you may not have had a, a sort of historical perspective placed upon it, but uh, if you've ever read the book, all I need to know I learned in kindergarten, you'll probably have a very good idea as to how Aristotle would view the, uh, the tender raising and upbringing and care and nurturing of a child in our culture. 